meeting of the Menlo Park Planning Commission. Established by state law, the commission is composed of seven volunteer voting age residents. Development proposals requiring a use permit, architectural control, variance, minor subdivision, and environmental review associated with these projects. The commission is the final decision-making body for these applications unless appealed to the city council. The commission also serves as a recommending body to the city council for major subdivisions, rezoning, conditional development permits, zoning ordinance amendments, general plan amendments, and the environmental reviews and below market rate housing agreements associated with these projects. We work closely with staff in our city's planning division. And they are responsible for coordinating enforcement of the zoning ordinance and related policies. Thank you to everyone for joining this evening. We encourage your active participation, whether you are an applicant or member of the public. There will be an opportunity to speak publicly during general public comment, as well as for each agenda item. I will turn to our clerk this evening, Vaughn Malathong, to explain how members of the public can participate during public comment periods. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you, Vice Chair. Regarding procedure for communication, I'm communicating. The commissioner will have their webcam on for the duration of the meeting for those presenting on Item tonight agenda, we kindly ask that you also turn off, turn on your microphone and webcam during your presentation for your item. A member of the staff will assign you a keyboard and mouse control if you are displaying the presentation. We then kindly ask that you turn off your webcam and microphone when done with the presentation portion of your item. Unless call upon the chair during the public comment period, member of the public will have an opportunity to share their comments or question by cl clicking on the hand icon or your scream upon which staff will introduce you and activate your microphone. Alternatively, for those calling to tonight's meeting, please press star nine on your keyboard to notify staff if you have a comment. Um, I'm turning back to Vice Chair. Um, thank you. So with that, this meeting is called to order. Um, Ms. Malathon, can I ask you a question about the screen, just in case anyone's tuning in through Zoom? Is this okay? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we'll move to item B, roll call. Commissioner Barnes? Here. Commissioner Eric? Here. Commissioner Farrick? Here. Commissioner Riggs? I'm here. Commissioner Schindler? Here. And I am present as well. Um, chair Harris is absent, so I will be um, acting as chair this evening. Um, so we'll move to item C, reports and announcements. Mr. Parada. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Doe and members of the commission. So a few updates uh, for the commission this evening, uh, really uh, some updates from the July 11th uh, city council meeting. So uh, on that meeting, the city council did introduce the ordinance that the planning commission had previously recommended. Uh, regarding community amenities, ordinance amendments or updates, uh, really some modifications to the appraisal review process um, and timing for the appraisal. Uh, so they did int introduce that on July 11th. It is uh, tentatively planned to come back on August 14th for its second reading. At the same meeting, the uh, City Council approved the updated community amenities list. So the list of the Planning Commission reviewed in June is now active um, and we're working on getting our website updated with that updated list. Uh, and that concludes my reports and announcements. Be happy to answer any commissioner questions. Thank you. Any questions? All right, so we will move then to item D, public comment. 
Under public comment, the public may address the commission on any subject not listed in the agenda. Each speaker may address the commission once for a limit of three minutes. You are not required to provide your name or city of residence, but it is helpful. And the commission cannot act on items not listed on the agenda and therefore cannot respond to non-agenda issues other than to provide general information. Ms. Malathon. I do not have anything, um, there's, I don't have any public comment or hand raised at this point. Thank you. Great, thank you. I think that's probably been enough time for people to um, consider if they want to speak. So we'll close item D, public comment. Um, there are no items under item E, consent calendar. So we'll go ahead and move on to F, public hearing. And the first item we have is F1. Bear with me while I read this. Um, architectural Control and Use Permits, Peninsula Innovation Partners, LLC, 1350 to 1390 Willow Road, 925 to 1090 Hamilton Avenue, and 1005 1275 Hamilton Court. Consider and adopt resolutions to approve architectural control review for buildings and site improvements for the hotel, residential building on parcel six, and the standalone senior below market rate BMR housing building on parcel seven, associated with the approved Willow Village master plan development project. The master plan, including the general plan amendment, rezoning and zoning map amendment, vesting tentative maps, conditional development permit, development agreement and BMR housing agreements were approved by the City Council on December 6 and 13, 2022 and authorized up to 1.6 million square feet of office and accessory uses with a maximum of 1.25 million square feet for office uses and the balance for accessory uses. Up to 1,730 dwelling units, including 312 BMR units, up to 200,000 square feet of retail and restaurant uses, and an up to 193 room hotel. The architectural control reviews by the Planning Commission check for conformance with the approved master plan, conditional development permit, development agreement, mitigation monitoring and reporting program, MMRP, for the certified environmental impact report, the RMU residential mixed use and O office zoning districts and other applicable requirements from the master plan governing documents. The requested actions Implement the Willow Village Master Plan Project and are consistent with the MMRP for the environmental impact report prepared for the proposed project and certified by the City Council on December 6, 2022. There's nothing further, therefore nothing further is required under the California Environmental Quality Act. The Planning Commission is scheduled to review three separate architectural control packages and use permit requests for the hotel, residential building on parcel six, and standalone senior BMR housing building parcel seven. The hotel would include up to 193 rooms and total approximately 162,000 square feet in size, including approximately 23,000 feet of ground floor retail and restaurant uses. The residential building on parcel six would include up to approximately 178 units, including 20 BMR units. The residential building on parcel seven would include 119 senior BMR units and one manager's unit. Additional architectural control packages will be considered at a few at future meetings. The proposals include associated use permit requests for modifications to design standards anticipated by the master plan, but not included in the conditional development permit. The use permit requests are generally summarized below. For the hotel, decrease the required interior setback and modify the projection allowances for awnings, signs, and canopies, including an allowance to encroach into the public access easement, West Street. Parcel six, modify modulation requirements along the building facade fronting the publicly accessible park. Turn it to staff for updates and presentation. Mr. Turner. Yes, thank you, Vice Chair Doe, for that introduction. I do have a brief presentation, followed by a presentation by the applicant 
Um, if I can get my presentation up. The other presentation, sorry, this is the next item. All right, thank you, Vaughn. So again, this is uh, the Willow Village architectural control packages for the hotel, parcel six and parcel seven. Next slide, please. So the recommended format for tonight's meeting, um, I will go over a brief introduction of the project. It's largely um, going to be a, a review of the previous meeting um, and the master plan itself. Uh, then we'll go into a presentation by the applicant to talk a little bit more about the uh, specific projects before you tonight. Then we will answer any um, initial commissioner questions, move to public comment, um, move back to the dais, and then ultimately look for an action on tonight's um, projects. Next slide, please. So staff introduction. Next slide. So just um, to recap, this is the Willow Village site. It's approximately 59 acres bounded by Willow Village to the, or Willow Road to the west, uh, the Life Science Bonus District to the east, uh, the Dumbarton Rail Corridor to the north, and the Hetch Hetchy Right of Way in Mid Peninsula High School to the south, along with other um, Life Science buildings. Next slide, please. Uh, the site is approximately 59 acres and consists of existing office and warehouse uses. A master plan conditional development permit and development agreement were approved by the City Council in December of last year. The project um, redevelopment of the site approved up to 1.6 million square feet of office and accessory uses, 1,730 dwelling units, um, and 857,000 square feet of open space, 360,000 of which would be uh, publicly accessible. Next slide, please. So the CDP requires subsequent approval of architectural control plans. Um, ACPs are intended to clarify and implement the con uh, conceptual designs of the individual parcels within the Willow Village site. Um, so these designs were generally reviewed during the during the review of the master plan. Um, and the three projects tonight are the hotel, parcel six, which is a residential residential building, and then parcel seven, which is the standalone um, senior below market rate housing project. Next slide, please. Um, parcels six and the hotel have um, some use permit requests the Bayfront districts allow design standards to be modified through the, the approval of a use permit. Um, <clears throat> the CDP itself approved many modifications uh, to, to the design standards of the office and RMU districts. Um, and these use permits um, are intended to clarify modifications that were conceptually approved of through the master plan process. Um, and it's important to note that the designs have not uh, changed substantively since the master planning process. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to the applicant.
Uh, oh, perfect. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Chair Doe, uh, Commissioners, uh, City Staff. Uh, th thanks for um, for scheduling this meeting. Uh, we're we're here once again to uh, do we have us do we have our presentation up yet? Don't want to look at the back of my head. There we go. <laughs> Okay, we're here once again to, to move on uh, s some key parts of, uh, of Willow Village um, and, uh, and sp specifically three parts. So, yeah, through the chair, um, if we could just pause the presentation for a second, we'll get through these technical difficulties. So uh, if the applicant could just hang tight for a minute. Um, and for those uh, potentially watching remotely, uh, we'll have the screen up in the council chambers here shortly. If you could just bear with us for a few minutes. Working again? Here we go. Are we ready to go again? Okay. I'll use this. I'll, I'll work at this screen. Um, as you can see, this is the existing site. This is our famous before picture. Um, and and uh, just to remind you, when we, when we took on the, the project, we really wanted to focus on good architecture and feel in the community. And so we engaged six different architects. You're gonna, we're going to hear from two of them on three buildings today. Um, so it was um, very important that we had a, cons a plan that was complementary, really focused on uh, the variety of people we're trying to serve in the community. Uh, obviously, uh, office re uh, office component related to Meta, but all of the residents were adding uh, you know, 1,730 uh, units. We want those that experience to be very good. A lot of retail, a grocery store, uh, neighbors who are who really are looking forward to the services we're going to provide for shopping, groceries, restaurants, and the like, as well as visitors on the hotel. So today we're going to talk about the the hotel, uh, one of the residential parcels that's adjacent to our community park, um, a real key park uh, uh, property for the arrival experience into this community. And then uh, the senior affordable, another key element to um, 
you know, everything we're experiencing in California is affordability and, and dealing with our seniors. So uh, ne next slide. So th this timeline is just to show, uh, highlight once again, the, the significant process we went through. Uh, this is just what was what happened in 2022. I, I uh, decided not to show the stuff from 2014 on. Next slide. And, and for 2023, um, this body heard um, the office campus and the grocery store in our last meeting. Today we have the hotel and um, uh, parcel, the residential parcel, and the senior affordable parcel. For the hotel, we've got uh, Softy Architects will make that presentation and, and walk the commission through their thinking um, as, as they go around that, uh, that building. And then we'll follow up with the uh, Piatok Architects who uh, design what we call our, our park residential right next to the community park and, and the adjacent parcel, parcel seven next to it, which is the senior affordable. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jaron Lubin, who will be on Zoom from Softy Architects. Thanks, Paul. Can you hear me okay? A little louder, please. Can you hear me all right? Commissioners, can you hear me loud enough? Okay. Go ahead, Jaron. Okay, thanks, Paul. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I hope you can hear me all right. Um, calling from our headquarters in Somerville, Massachusetts, and sorry I can't be there tonight. I'm going to be explaining the design of the hotel, uh, which, uh, if you is uh, clearly located in this um, illustration uh, on Plan Excuse North. Excuse me if I can interrupt. Um, we're having trouble hearing, actually. Should I just try to speak louder? Let's let's try that. Thank you. How's that? Can you hear me any better? That's a lot better. Thanks. So my name is Jaron Lubin. I'm here from Softy Architects. I will be talking about the hotel, which is just to the west of the town square. This is an orientating map that maps on top of the um, illustration and photo that Paul just shared with you all. Next. Next, please. So the hotel is located to the west of the town square. Um, it's highlighted in this drawing here. And the last meeting that I shared with you, the design of the town square, which is at the center of the page. And the hotel has a very unique position related to the town square as a kind of Western flank and border uh, to this very public and communal space. Next. Um, in terms of a building typology, it holds the corner on Willow and Main Street. It's uh, a courtyard design at the center of which it has this really beautiful garden, uh, which I'll show you in a, in a few slides, and uh, a very animated retail uh, frontages, activated frontages along Main Street, Willow Road, and uh, great frontages along the town square. Next. The first view of the hotel is just opposite the market, which was also presented to you in our last uh, meeting by one of our architect colleagues. This is the arrival to Willow Village on Main Street. Uh, next, you can see a very clear indication of the corner condition. And we worked hard that this entire corner would be open to express and be activated. Uh, you see here the F&B, the dining of the hotel and the lobby of the hotel. Um, express the corner of uh, and the arrival to uh, Willow Village. Next. You then rise up into the town square and the hotel is right behind us and on the left. The port cochere is a key feature of the hotel. It's on the left hand side of the screen and it carries the same language or a similar language to the retail pavilion that we shared with you that's on the south side of the town square and also some of the other themes of planting and landscape that frame and give character to this public space. Next. And so here you see the view to the hotel from the town square. The Port Cochere is immediately in front of you. On the left-hand side, you see some of the activities that are on the ground level of the hotel. 
there's some F and B uh, and food and beverage and retail spaces facing uh, the town square. On the right hand side of the screen, you also see some of those activities, the activation again, some food and beverage retail opportunities. Um, on the second floor of the hotel on the right hand side of the screen, you also see some trees planted on top of the building. And this is actually the amenity deck for the hotel guests. Um, uh, at the center of the screen, you see the uh, garden, which would be animated on three sides of the ground level of the hotel by the lobby, by the dining spaces, and all the amenities of the hotel kind of spill into this, this central garden that everybody can see from the town square. And it's accessible uh, for the guests of the hotel as well as anybody visiting uh, Willow Village. Next. I'm now gonna pass the presentation to my colleague, Marcial, who's gonna take you through a brief presentation on the residential parcel. Oh, Pi Talk Architects, can you hear me? There, there we go, sorry. My name is Marcial Chow. I'm the lead principal at Pi Talk Architects. Um, leading the design of the two multifamily residential buildings that are part of the Willow Village mixed use development. I'll be presenting the park residential building, which is parcel six, and the adjacent affordable senior building. Next. Park residential building is located at the southern border of Willow Village, located along Park Street between the community park on the west and the affordable senior on the east, and another public park further east. The building contains 178 units in a seven-story building, five levels over a two-story podium next. Park residential building is, located, is organized around two linear residential massings connected by a central amenity bridge, creating two courtyards, one active on the west side, which maximizes solar exposure and houses the swimming pool and related activities and opens towards the park. The other is a passive courtyard on the east, which houses quiet seating and lounging areas. The residential mass fronts Park Street to reinforce the street wall. Next. This is the west elevation facing the community park. A lot of attention was placed on ground floor activation via use of transparent glazing at the main building lobby located on the left corner of this image. The two-story two townhomes line the remaining portion of the ground floor facing the park. The courtyard above opens to the community park, maximizing solar exposure, and much attention has been paid to articulate the roof line via south-facing slope roofs which allow for placement of solar PV panels. Please note the park design depicted in this image is a placeholder since the park is currently in design. Next. This is the view as one enters Park Street from the west. The main glazed residential lobby is at this corner. The facade along Park Street incorporates upper floor step backs with loft units to help minimize the apparent mass of the building. Next. Park Street, the Park Street sidewalk, which is an important pedestrian connection between the two public parks, is activated via ground floor townhomes with raised entry stoops and beautiful landscaping. Use of warm materials complement the structural concrete of the podium and glazing to create an inviting streetscape. Next. The two buildings were designed together, taking advantage of a mid-block alley where parking garage entrances and utilities are strategically centralized to keep them out of the Park Street frontage. This image shows a continuation of the residential open spaces in, in the two buildings, which visually connect the public parks on either side. Uh, thank you, and I'm gonna now move to present the affordable building. Okay, next. The senior affordable building contains 120 units in a six-story building, five over one, a one-story podium. As mentioned before, it is located on next slide, sorry. As mentioned before, it is located on the southern border of the village, flanked by Park Street Residential on the west and a public park on the on the east. Next. The triangular lot allowed us to concentrate all the residential massing along one continuous rectangular massing along Park Street to help reinforce reinforce the street wall along Park Street, with a landscape courtyard and a one-story pavilion filling out the remainder of the triangle. Next. This is a view of the Park Street elevation. 
The ground floor is activated by a continuous pedestrian arcade with transparent glazing containing all the various amenity programs serving the res seniors at the ground floor. Use of grouped recess balconies in the upper floors promotes social connection between neighbors and also provides massing articulation of the facade. Upper floor st stepbacks further reduce the apparent massing and building height on the street. In addition to private terraces on the upper floor units, there is a shared common deck at the very east end of the building with great views of the bay. Next. This is an image showing the ground floor arcade, which helps to widen the pedestrian sidewalk and provides covered shelter space for the seniors to gather and feel connected to the street life. Fully transparent glazing helps connect the inside of the building to the arcade in addition to lush landscaping. Next. This is the view from the from East Street at the intersection of East Street and Park Street. This is an important intersection since it provides safe controlled pedestrian crossings of Park Street to reach the rest of the village. A large sidewalk bulb out is proposed to help reduce the crosswalk width. The main building entrance is located here, denoted by the vertically glazed elevator lobbies at the upper floors, providing views down East Streets and towards Main Street. Next. These next several slides will help to describe the amenity programming for the senior residents. The ground floor has a continuous glazed wall separating the covered arcade with a circulation spine, which helps to bring in natural light into the ground floor. Next. Here is a blow up of the west side of the ground floor showing the main entry, the mail lounge, and elevator core. The manager's office, resident service offices are located here as well with a small conference room. Next. This is a blow up of the east side of the ground floor showing the health service offices, bicycle room, multi-purpose community room. The community room has an indoor outdoor connection to a private outdoor gathering area on the east. Next. The second floor podium level contains a community pavilion located within the landscape courtyard. Next. This community pavilion has an enclosed gathering space at this level with a kitchen with indoor outdoor connections. There is also a landscape roof deck on top of the pavilion that provides additional common outdoor space for the senior residents. The landscape courtyard contains multiple seating areas and gathering spaces and gets plenty of southern light. Next. And this is the reason why we are all here to build affordable housing for our most precious resource in our community, our seniors. Thank you. I'll give the podium back to Paul. Thanks, Marcial. Um, that concludes the presentation, and we'll take some some questions. But one thing I just wanted to, to reemphasize, which is kind of fun as a developer, is you've got three different buildings, and they each have a different ground floor experience and a, a vibrant and active ground floor experience. Most of the times, it, that's one of the hardest things to do in multifamily and high density projects is to have that interactive nature throughout a, a project. And so if you think about the hotel being tied into the town square, it's got visitors, it's got residents, neighbors shopping, um, office visitors, a lot of activity there, which will happen uh, all the time. As we move down to the park, it's next to the, uh, the the park residential. It's next to the community park, which by by its own nature is going to create its activity. And we've put deliberately some living units there with stoops to uh, the concept of eyes on the eyes on the public space for safety and and also activity. And then for the seniors, we've got all of their ground floor activities. That's also there for their safety. They live up up above, but for a good vibrant senior life we want that interaction to take place there and always be there and so for us as developers it's really a it's it's a privilege to be able to put together something where you're not struggling to get that ground floor activated with retail or other so i hope you can appreciate that we spent a lot of time trying to make that um human scale to that, that wherever the people touch the building they can feel good and the like so with that um we'll open it for whatever's next on your agenda Kyle, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, and with that, we can take any initial um, questions of staff or the applicant. Great, thank you. Any clarifying questions? Commissioner Eric. Thank you. I believe through the chair, this is a question for Mr. Lubin about the hotel. And apologies if this information was included 
and I just didn't catch it, but the ground floor of the hotel, are there planned entrances to the hotel from either Willow Road or Main Street, or is the only entrance to the hotel from the town square side? Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Great. So the primary entrance to the hotel is from the town square via the Port Cochere. So you'll get dropped off or you'll arrive as a pedestrian or from bicycle from the town square. You'll enter through the garden and then there's kind of an open um, access to the check-in facilities directly off of. Uh, so we're funneling everyone through the garden as a concept to enter the hotel. Okay, thank you. I might have more comments later, but that concludes my question. Any other clarifying questions before we move to public comment? All right. Um, well, then let's move to public comment. Um, for that, we'll turn to Ms. Um, Malathong. Thank you, Vice Chair Do. As a reminder, members of the public can press the hand icon on your screen upon which staff will introduce you and activate your microphone. Alternatively, for those calling into tonight meeting, please press star nine on your keyboard to notify staff that you have a comment. For any member of the public who are sharing a Zoom account um, or phone line with another commentator during this meeting, please inform staff at the start of the meeting without a public comment and staff will ensure that other commentators speak after you have finished your comment. And then if you are attending in person, um, there's a car in the, um, in the back there, please complete that and hand it over to me. Thank you. Great, thank you. Let us know if there's any commenters. At this point, there's nobody um, raise their hand or a common card that I have received. Thank you. Okay, I think maybe that was enough time while you were giving the instructions. Um, so let's close public comment and take it back to the dais for a discussion um, and ultimately a vote. Anyone like to start? Sure. <laughs> Commissioner Riggs. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll address this to Paul, um, and it won't surprise you at all that I'm going to ask about uh, transportation. So I just want to have a sense before we vote tonight whether there's been any progress that we don't know about, about uh, public transportation and in particular um, cross bay transportation. The, uh, the, the transportation um, uh, issue uh, as, part of, as part of the environmental impact report we were, and, and the city's ordinances, we were required to have a, a really extensive study of traffic and all our alternative means and methods to get people around in our transportation management program. So we have uh, Meta's um, probably the, the finest shuttle system um, in the Bay Area as a key component. But there are um, we will have a community shuttle associated with the grocery store, um, and that will open when the grocery store uh, does open. And it will not only take in consideration of the the Bellhaven neighborhood, but also the Bayfront neighborhood that goes down past Marsh Road. Um, we'll have extensive uh, bike programs and and other um, activities to try to get uh, cars off the street. We've uh, you know eliminated um, parking on the street and have done that in in structures with shared parking. And the shared parking allows us to be a lot more efficient and build a lot fewer spaces. So it's a combination of a lot of things to try to reduce traffic. Unfortunately, we don't have a big move. Um, Connecting East Bay, um, there are things that we, we um, that Meta and and our team are um, willing to outreach to uh, the uh, Samtrans on on various ideas uh, that they might have to use the Dunbarn corridor. But there's nothing has gelled now, so that'll take a lot of dialogue moving forward to see if there can be ways that we can uh, add to the uh, transportation issues that are uh, additive to what we've already baked into 
Willow Village with the additional entrances and exits to the east and creating the, the, the access down to O'Brien. So. Well, I want to make sure that I acknowledge uh, Meta's continuing effort to provide uh, shuttles, um, particularly for the immediate um, neighborhood mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and for short runs. Um, Unfortunately, not so much to Menlo Park downtown, but I guess to Palo Alto and to Redwood City. Yeah. Um, as uh, we all know, the expressway has a lot of trouble handling the traffic that's already there. And we're going to rejuvenate 1.3 million square feet um, with a fair amount of uh, housing as well as office. And um, of course, it's in the midst of uh, a growth area to begin with. So regional transportation remains um, out of reach. Um, and uh, I, I don't think that's, uh, that can be in any way laid at the feet of Meta. Um, but it is an unfortunate situation um, that colors how we look at major projects. So thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Commissioner Ferrick. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple of questions. I think I'll start with four, maybe it's a, a staff question. On page 17, table six, the, the open space calculations were a little bit confusing. I'm wondering if you can kind of shed some light on that, how the, the required open space doesn't total I don't know if I'm just looking at it wrong, but the total required and proposed doesn't seem to align with the uh, um, figures above. So I'm just trying to make sure I'm understanding what the right figures are. It's on uh, page 17 in case for parcel seven proposed open space. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, it is a little bit confusing to, to explain. So in the RMU district, um, projects are required to have a general amount of open space for the project, but it's also required to have um, open space for the residences, and that can either be provided as private open spaces like balconies um, or common open spaces um, such as like the um, pool deck and other common areas like that. Um, this table, it, it's hard to make a table when there's a mixture of the two. Um, so the minimum private open space uh, of 9,600 square feet, that would be if the project only provided private open spaces to meet the requirement. Um, similarly, the, the minimum common open space would be if the project only provided common open space to, um, to satisfy the requirement. Um, so, uh, but there's a mixture of, of the two. Um, basically, there's a calculation where whatever you don't provide in the form of um, private open spaces, you have to provide 1.25 square feet of common open space to make up the difference. Um, so the applicant is providing a little over 2,800 square feet of, of private open space, um, little uh, almost 10,000 square feet of common open space, and then together um, that uh, gets us to almost 13,000 square feet of open space. Um, which counts towards the minimum required open space for the parcel as a whole. Okay, and if so then it does, when it, you know, with the combination of private and common open space, meet that 1.25 square feet or better requirement? Yes, okay. yes. Thank you. Yeah, that is a tricky one to represent in a table for sure. Um, I'm curious why the the total under required open space that's total required slash proposed that figure 8,026. Is that what the this parcel's 
minimum number combo is, or I'm not sure what that represents. Sorry, I should have explained that a little bit more. Um, so the minimum required open space is uh, based on the lot size. Um, if I remember correctly, I want to say it's 25% of the lot size. So the 8,000 square feet is 25% of the lot size. That's the open space they're required to provide. And that can be, um, like I said, the, the common open space, the private open space, but it also can include um, areas not covered by the building, kind of general open space on the ground floor. Okay. Um, so they're required to provide 8,000 square feet based on lot size. Um, and then the private and common open spaces factor into that. Okay, great. Thank you. That's helpful. I think I get it now. Good to know. Um, just was wondering if I was having a math challenge that I was unaware of. Um, okay, so I have another one probably also for you, if I can just move to that, and then I'll also have some questions of the applicant. Um, so I'm a little less up to speed than probably the commissioners that have been or in, involved in this project for several years, but page 19, um, there's the lead ambition to build sustainable buildings, and it has higher level of ambition for larger projects, which I understand. But I guess for the smaller buildings, is there an ambition? I don't know about getting a, they, is there a requirement that applicants now have to have them certified? Or is there an ability to aspire to a higher sustainability level than silver, but not necessarily have it certified? Um, like or or differently certified like well building challenge or um, other less I don't know sometimes expensive although wells expensive too because uh, I see why sometimes smaller buildings don't get certified because it's this kind of cumbersome high bar yeah so currently under the um, Bayfront zoning districts LS office and RMU um, the only way to meet this requirement is through LEED. At one point, we were at LEED certification. Um, that is, at one point, we were working on putting together um, a way to certify, not certify, but um, confirm that the building was the equivalent of the LEED silver <laughs> gold levels. Um, at the moment, there aren't any other requirements as far as, um, you know, requiring lead silver, but then pushing for, um, gold. you know, more sustainable, but maybe not quite gold. There's nothing in, in that range um, that would have to be, um, you know, looked at at the city council level and um, okay. come to us as a uh, an ordinance update. But currently, um, projects have to certify lead to uh, to meet that requirement. Okay, thank you. I think the next couple questions I have are for the applicant. So, through the chair, may I ask um, Paul? Can you come back up? Or great, hi. You're <laughs> changing out. <laughs> great, hi. Nice to see you. Um, Thank you for H.T. Harvey's bird safe design. Uh, that was quite a, an extensive report that was included and really interesting. Um, on page 96, kind of toward the beginning um, to page 98, there was w reasons for waivers um, for certain requirements. And I'm wondering if, if you could just kind of explain a little bit more about what, what the conditions are that require that. I saw that H.T. Harvey understood and supported the need for them, but I'm just would love to understand it more from your perspective. Sure. Can you hear me okay? Sure. Great. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Good and the city set up its its um, its quote waiver uh, uh, criteria uh, specifically because not every situation fits every building, and so you essentially have to have a, a functional equivalency so you can solve for various bird safe design attributes. Uh, and measures um, 
by using kind of a prescribed you know list or a functional equivalent and so I'd, i'll go back to that in a moment okay. uh and refer to it and come back to you potentially but just wanted to let you know there's a essentially a functional equivalency that you, you, as you're designing buildings there may not be a, a specific uh, element that works in a certain situation. So the, the, the waiver process and staff can, can uh, address this for you as well has been set up to allow you to achieve the same goal, but in different ways. Got it. Yeah. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, the rest of my notes are comments, so I'll save those for later. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Farrick, um, for your questions. Does anyone... Commissioner Eric. Hello. Um, I want to first start by acknowledging that I appreciate all of the street level activation that has been done in the comments that Paul made along those lines. My comments, I guess, pick up on where my question left off, which is it, it wasn't clear to me from the designs whether or not the ground floor of the hotel um, will have uh, any sort of dining or retail, but I would love to see or at least understand why it can't be done some sort of entrance from either willow or main street it feels a little bit like we're blocking off the community by you know if, if someone wants to enter whatever's on the ground floor of that hotel forcing them to go all the way around into the obviously the town square would be nice but it feels potentially a little bit more welcoming to have an entrance from the ground floor there might be reasons why that's not possible and i'm I'd be curious to understand those. In the case of the um, of the housing that we saw, it makes more sense to me from a housing perspective that people might not want to live with their residents, uh, you know, ex entering and exiting onto Willow Road, which is very busy. But for a hotel and retail situation, that feels like an opportunity to bring in the community a little bit more. Commissioner Eric, thank you. And I, I may ask uh, Jaron to uh, comment as well. Just clarification, um, there are two entrances to uh, the hotel. First, obviously, and, and very intentional, uh, and Jaron can talk about this in terms of drawing uh, uh, people into uh, Willow Village, drawing them into Town Square. So that that very uh, you know primary entrance. There's also an entrance uh, to the restaurant through which you could enter the hotel as well um, at Main and West Street. So we do have direct access mm -hmm. from Main uh, mid block um, across from the market to be able to draw you in. We also have um, significant um, uh, site uh, work that we'll be doing uh, to address sea level rise and particularly at that location at Willow and Maine. And so in terms of uh, being able to locate, um, you know, entrances, exit, it's, it becomes a very uh, significant um, operational challenge uh, there. And so what we've done is we've identified those key points on Main at West as well as the, the entry. So just wanted to clarify that there are in fact two. Yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, that's helpful detail on all fronts, and um, I think that's mostly what I wanted to ask. I think Great. the designs of all three are, are beautiful, and I appreciate all of the work that has gone into them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Eric. Actually, I have a follow-up question on that, and it's not on these buildings, but just um, that was helpful to know about that entrance on Main across from the grocery store, and because of the gray change going from street level to the raised site, can you remind us again where the entrance is to the grocery store, all the entrances? Is it because it obviously has the same challenge of navigating the grade change? Did, and there's the, the site essentially, well, I'll let Paul cover it. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's an, an entrance at the corner of, of Main and West. Um, and then on the, um, and, and on the, what I would call mid block, of parcel two there's entrance um, right where center street comes down to the project there's entrance to the garage and there's street level parking in the garage and, uh, and the uh, grocery store has an entrance right there and then um, there's a second story of uh, parking and there will be a, an elevator and, and likely um, an escalator to get you into the the uh, uh, grocery store entrance so the main pedestrian entrance will be at, at West and Main, 
on that that south uh, excuse me that would be on on parcel that would be the the north east corner and then just continuing down west street you'll see another entrance where our market walk ends where the elevator brings people down from the parking structure so there's an entrance there and it's right at center street so there's a vehicle access at center street there's also vehicle access directly across from that off of willow road to get people in there so that that's how it'll be there because um just a little tidbit, Willow Road can't be raised. It's out Caltran, Caltrans Road. The site has to come up five feet for um, sea level rise. So there's a five foot grade differential from Willow Road to west. And so that's why it's very problematic to do an entrance on Willow. Thank you. So when you're walking on Willow, sorry, I just, when you're walking on Willow there, it's Five feet. Yeah, you'll see. You'll see. We, landscaping. we have some great landscaping and the like, and then you, as you come up to, to make it feel good while you're there. But that's the only way we can uh, we can deal with the constraints of uh, it's sort of a 3D Rubik's cube <laughs> that we have to we have Thank to navigate. You. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments, questions from the commission? I'll just make my comments now. Sure, like that sounds kind of good. wrapping up. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I just would, you know, by way of comments, uh, very excited about the 193 room hotel for both, you know, the functional practical element, but the design and and then the great revenues to the city that that will provide. Um, the the other thing I liked, just sort of by way of comment about the. Um, bird safe design report was how it gave such an exciting kind of. Uh, uh, visual of the community, you know, pavilion, which I know isn't on today's docket, but I just thought that was a really great way to kind of view it. And I'm, I'm excited about that um, building too. And then I really like the senior housing. It kind of reminds me of a ship and it's tough to build a nice sized project on a skinny triangle. And so um, I thought that was a really great use of that space, considering the occupants and maybe the type of open space that they could best uh, use. It made total sense and I like that there's a nice substantial community space too. It's always nice to be able to have some places like that in, in residential communities like that to kind of have a classes or family events or whatever. Um, so really thoughtful on those parts of the design. Um, yeah, so just excited about it. So if you're ready, Chair, for a motion, I'm happy to make one unless others want to comment further no please go ahead i i think we've um given everyone plenty of um time if you would is that a motion that you would like to make i'm happy to do so but i i'm looking at commissioner riggs who might i think you're reaching for the microphone as i began to, to talk so i don't want to uh jump ahead uh i have five or six brief comments to make but uh it shouldn't impede you getting things started well, okay, then I shall make a motion to approve. Um, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to read the report. The the header, it's a it's a long one. Um, architectural control and use permits. Um, is that sorry, I just want to make sure I'm couching it right. I know sometimes those are uh, important to correctly word motions for this sort of thing. Um, so architectural control and use permits for Peninsula Innovation Partners uh, for Parcel 6, Parcel 7, and what's the other one? The hotel. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you for that. And um, I apologize, Commissioner Riggs, for not. Um, please. Oh, no, my light wasn't on yet. Uh, <laughs> okay. Ms. Farrick is just uh, quite astute. Um, so I, I did wanted to respond specifically to the five actions tonight. Um, and um, I, uh, I, I felt this way before historically a couple of decades ago. There's something about um, voicing approval f uh, of the architectural work of two of the best architects in the United States. Um, but anyway, I'm pleased to do that uh, uh, for the design of the hotel uh, and certainly approve uh, uh, 
the modification to the design standards uh, for the office zoning district. Uh, similarly, the design for the residential building on parcel six. Uh, I think it's going to be another fantastic building. And again, the uh, modification for design standards um, in RMU. And then finally, the design for the senior building and with just um, an add on statement of appreciation um, to Meta to uh, have worked out. It's not just the agreement with someone to build it, but it's finding a separate site to do it, which has often been a challenge um, that I've been aware of um, since 01 or so. Um, so I just wanted to express that appreciation. Um, I would like to ask if uh, if we are going to um, vote on these three recommendations, would it be possible to separate them? Um, because I uh, will feel in a position to vote for one of them rather than all three. Is that a question to to, to staff, Commissioner Riggs? I guess it should be. Um, yes, so the there are three separate actions. Um, one for the resolution for the hotel, one for the parcel six, and one for parcel seven. Um, they can certainly be done in, in one um, motion um, or be separated, um, however you see fit. Through the chair as the maker of the motion, I'm happy to make those separately if that's more agreeable to the commissioners. So let's yeah. do that. If, okay. Let's do that, Commissioner Farrick. Um, okay. And just before we do that, I would just insert my comments. I agree with Commissioner comments on the architecture. And um, I also appreciate Commissioner Riggs bringing up the issue of regional transportation and the impact that this development will have on the community in terms of connectivity. Um, but however, that the vote today is regarding the um, architectural control. I just do hope that as a community, we can continue to address those connectivity issues and, and appreciate that the shuttles, the part that they play in, in, in addressing that. I'll turn it back over to you, Commissioner Farrick, to... Um, sure, why don't I... Um amend the mo motion to just start with uh, the hotel. So I propose or I move that we approve, oh my gosh, where'd it go? Architectural control and use permits uh, for the hotel parcel. Thank you. So first. Um, through, the, through the chair, sorry for oops. interrupting. No, I no. just want to confirm that that is um, as proposed by staff in the staff report. Yes, I mean, as we for attachment been, A, all right. I believe, yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> Was there a different version that I should be aware of? <laughs> <laughs> no, just in case there were any amendments um, that okay. you wanted to propose. So if it's um, per the staff report, um, per attachment A, that would that'd be all you need to say. As City Council once famously did, uh, approved a project from this DS with the exception that it should be a single story building. Oh, that would be a little bit of a modification. <laughs> yes, that was historical. A first from Commissioner Farrick. Se se I'm happy to second, <laughs> second the motion for the hotel. Thank the you, Commissioner Shinshin, for the hotel. Um, so with that, if there's no further questions, we'll move to a vote to approve the architectural control plans and requested use permit for the hotel. I'm sorry, mate. May I offer clarification? I think we're bifurcating these into attachments um, because with a specific resolution, there are architectural con control plans and then there's use permits associated with each attachment. So if I would just offer to the chair, if we voted on each attachment, attachment A, attachment B, attachment C, we could parse these out one by one because each attachment has some nuances to it. Thank you, Commissioner Barnes. Let me just make sure I understand um I think attachment a is what we're looking at right now. yeah so that that's the order in which 
the sorry to cut in commissioner Doe, the or the um that's the same kind of thing i think it's just called something different looking at page five of the staff report through the chair to offer some clarification Please. um yeah, so the, the resolution would, would capture both the architectural control and the use permits. Um, there's no need to separate them between the architectural control and the use permits. So, for example, attachment A, the resolution for the hotel parcel um, would include uh, architectural control and the use permits for the hotel parcel as uh, they're just attachments to the resolution. Okay, thank you, Mr. Turner. Commissioner Barnes, does that? Um, yes, uh, attachment A is inclusive of, of both those. So as long as we're voting on the attachment, then I, that covers what is in the attachment. So, and I, that that was my understanding. Is that? But thank you, thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, so um, we're voting now, um, Commissioner Barnes. Uh, on attachment A, yes. Yeah, attachment you. A, yes. Voting on attachment A. Commissioner Eric? Yes. Commissioner Farrick? Yes. Commissioner Riggs? No. Commissioner Schindler? Yes. I am also a um, yes, so that's five yeses and one no. And um, the motion to approve. Uh, Attachment A, the architectural control plans in use permit for the hotel passes. Um, so now um, we'll move to um, take action on attachment B, and that's for to approve the architectural control plans for the parcel six residential building and the requested use permits. Um, anyone like to make a motion regarding that one? I don't need to hog up all the motioning. Oops, so others are welcome to jump in on that. <laughs> Commissioner, thank you. First from Commissioner Schindler. Yes, I, I enthusiastically uh, move that we adopt a resolution to approve the elements of, of attachment B, architectural control, and the requested use permits as it relates to the mixed use residential. Um, this is a critical project. The plans look fantastic. The variance that the, the use permit modifications are completely aligned with the master plan and the spirit of the project. And I wouldn't want anything to stand in its way. Thank you. And a through, second from through the chair, just to confirm, um, as a, recommended by staff. As recommended okay. by staff. As Thank written you. and recommended Thank by you. staff. Thank you. I'm happy to second. Second from Commissioner Eric. And with that, with a first from Commissioner Schindler, a second from Commissioner Eric, we'll um, vote on um, attachment B, with which is the parcel six residential building. Commissioner Barnes. Yes. Commissioner Eric. Yes. Commissioner Farrick. Yes. Commissioner Briggs. No. And Commissioner Schindler. Yes. I am also a yes, so that's five yeses, one no. Um, so the um, resolution to approve the architectural control permits and use permits for parcel six residential building passes. Um, and finally, we'll move to um, attachment C, adopt a resolution to approve the architectural control plans for the senior BMR housing building. Commissioner Riggs. Yes, I'd like to move uh, to adopt the resolution to approve the architectural plan. Thank you. For attachment C, per the staff report. Per second. the staff report. <laughs> okay. First from Commissioner Riggs, second from Commissioner Farrick. Um, well, now vote. Commissioner Barnes. Yes. Commissioner Eric. Yes. Commissioner Farrick. Yes. Commissioner Riggs. Yes. Commissioner Schindler. Yes. And I will also vote yes. So that's six um, yeses and the resolution to approve the architectural control plans for the senior BMR housing building on parcel seven passes. Um, so with that, believe that we can close item F1.
thank you for your time this evening to the applicant. And um, I believe that moves us to item F2. Item F2 is the general plan circulation element in El Camino Real downtown specific plan amendments, City of Menlo Park. Consider amendments to the City of Menlo Park general plan circulation element in El Camino Real downtown specific plan to allow for the City Council to consider closing a portion of Santa Cruz Avenue in public alleys, such as Ryan's Lane, to vehicle traffic. The proposed amendments would modify the street classifications in the general plan circulation element to incorporate an alley designation within the local access street classification and allow for the city council to consider street closures within the main street, such as Santa Cruz Avenue, and local access alley classifications. I apologize, I might be... In additional locations to the central plaza identified in the specific plan. Additional clarifying text amendments would be required in both the El Camino Real downtown specific plan and general circle general plan circulation element for internal consistency and consistency between each plan. The proposed amendments would be limited to minor circulation changes and modifications to public space and would not increase the development potential of the general plan or El Camino Real downtown specific plan. The Planning Commission is a recommending body to the City Council on the proposed amendments. If the City Council approves the proposed amendments, the City Council may consider actions to close the street segment and alley as a separate action. The City Council certified a program level environmental impact report EIR as part of approving the general plan update on November 29, 2016 and certified a subsequent EIR to the general plan program EIR as part of adopting the housing element update on January 31st, 2023. The City Council certified a different program level EIR as part of approving the El Camino Real downtown specific plan on June 5th, 2012. Each proposed amendment has been evaluated regarding the impacts identified in its respective certified EIR. And that analysis has found that the proposed amendments would not result in new impacts or in an increase in severity of previous, previously identified impacts or would not result in new impacts or an increase. I am so sorry. I think I am tripping up over these. <laughs> or otherwise require additional environmental review or processing under the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA. An addendum to each certified EIR has been prepared as authorized under CEQA to describe the proposed amendment and its relationship to the original approval and its already recognized environmental impacts. Determine that the proposed general plan and downtown specific plan amendments as outlined in each addendum are consistent with the respective certified EIR and that no further environmental review is required under CEQA guidelines sections 15162 and 15164. Mr. Prada. The updates in our presentation. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Doe and members of the commission. Staff does have a presentation for the commission this evening. Uh, so once that's up, I can get started. Um, it, it's a relatively brief presentation. Uh, I can, while we're pulling that up, get started here with just a few updates though. So we did receive and the commission received it directly, an item of correspondence. Um, prior to or post uh, publication of staff report, but prior to this evening's meeting, uh, relaying concerns about uh, the potential uh, for more permanent uh, or long-term street closures, but relaying some um, general support for the streeteries using uh, parking spaces. Uh, so with that, if I can get the next slide up. Thank you, Vaughn. Uh, so the meeting format, so this evening, if we can go back one, there's a staff presentation, which we're in the midst of here. Um, I did just provide a staff's update regarding public comments. And then uh, following this presentation to provide an overview of the proposal this evening, uh, the Planning Commission can or should ask at that time clarifying questions of staff, uh, then open up the public hearing for public comment, and then uh, close public comment uh, 
for planning commission discussion and ultimately a recommendation. So uh, just to make it clear this evening that the ask in front of the planning commission is for the planning commission to review these proposed amendments to the city's general plan circulation element and the El Camino Real downtown specific plan. I will probably shorten those to general plan or circulation element or specific plan because it's going to get a little wordy throughout. Uh, so, so hopefully that that sets some context there. Uh, the recommendation would be to the city council, who would be the final decision making body on any amendments to the two plans. Uh, there are two resolutions before the planning commission this evening, so there would need to be individual actions on each resolution. Each resolution would be to amend each plan, the general plan or the specific plan individually and includes the um, California, California Environmental Quality Act findings related to the addendum for each specific plan. So, so they are unique, two separate actions. And with that, if we can move to the next slide. So a little bit of background this evening. So the, um, the city is in the process of developing an outdoor dining or streetery program. Um, this was reviewed by the city council through a study session in February of this year. Um, the program would ultimately replace the current uh, temporary outdoor use permits or TOPES. Um, and as part of its study session in February, the City Council discussed uh, some more detailed design guidelines and standards, as well as expressed an interest in continuing the current street closures on Santa Cruz Avenue and Ryan's Lane. Uh, the Santa Cruz Avenue street closure is in the 600 block on the eastbound uh, side of the street, uh, the westbound continues to remain open to, to vehicle traffic and Ryan's Lane is the portion between Crane and Escondido Lane for context. I should have provided the commission with a map here, my apologies. Uh, a little bit more background, the previous outdoor dining initiatives. So as I mentioned, the TOPE, that's the current program that uh, essentially needs to end or ended with the end of the state of emergency. And so we're looking at staff level uh, to develop the outdoor dining streetery program to replace that. The city has a history of some outdoor dining prior to that with the 2015 Santa Cruz Avenue Cafe pilot program. So that started to utilize parking spaces in, in similar parklet uh, formats that started popping up throughout the Bay Area at that time. The uh, city created its own pilot program in 2015. And so if I can get to the next slide. So just go back one slide. So this evening, uh, and we'll, the next slide, you, you saw a preview of it, we'll go into the more of the specifics of the actual amendments themselves. But just to set a little bit of context of where we're at uh, with this process. So uh, as, as I mentioned tonight, the Planning Commission's review and recommendation on the proposed amendments to the uh, downtown specific plan and the general plan. Following tonight's meeting, um, pending the outcome of the evening, the City Council would consider the Planning Commission's recommendation on the proposed amendments. So that staff is tentatively scheduled for August of this year. Um, at that same meeting for the Council to consider the proposed amendments to the specific plan and uh, general plan, the Council uh, would also consider introducing the streetery ordinance. Um, the street ordinance will be housed in Title 13 of the Mental Park Municipal Code. So the ordinance itself is not in the zoning ordinance, so it does not go before the Planning Commission. It would be City Council reviewing and acting on um, that ordinance itself uh, without the Planning Commission as a recommending body. I just want to um, clarify that. And that's because it's in Title 13 and, and deals with public right away. And the Planning Commission's purview is, is typically or more solely on private property um, with some limited exceptions to that. And let's see, where was I? So then, oh, sorry. So at, the, at, at that meeting, when the, the council uh, considers introducing in, uh, the street ordinance, they would also consider adoption uh, through a separate resolution, the detailed streetery design guidelines and standards for the community to use um, in developing a streetery um, um, permit submittals to the city. Uh, following the introduction to the street ordinance, the council would need to adopt the ordinance at a second reading. That would, would ultimately be in the August or September timeframe pending the outcome of the introduction of the ordinance. Uh, once again, these dates are tentative um, and subject to change, but just to provide the commission with some timeline for where we're at this evening and what, what is uh, ahead of us in this process. Um, if the ordinance is adopted, uh, and the, and the 
amendments to the general plan and specific plan are also adopted by the city council uh, the city council could consider through a separate resolution whether or not to close santa cruz avenue or ryan's lane um, in a temporary or longer term um, uh, program so these amendments this evening give the council the flexibility to consider those street closures which it currently does not have uh, due to inconsistency with the city's uh, general plan circulation element and downtown specific plan. So if I can get the next slide. So as I've kind of alluded to or explained throughout in the staff report, uh, provides more details on uh, the proposed amendments to the general plan circulation element and specific plan. They're really intended to provide the city council with flexibility to consider uh, street closures. Um, that are currently in, in a temporary fashion downtown, um, you know, within the main street uh, street classification, which is uh, currently only Santa Cruz Avenue is designated as a main street in the city circulation element and local access alley uh, street classification. So staff's proposal is to amend the table one of the general plan circulation element to add a local access alley. Um, which would be a subset of local access in the street classifications with some specifics to it regarding um, width uh, and, and, and access and, and usability. Um, and then also to allow through the language in the table flexibility for the city council to consider street closures within the main street and the new or, or added local access alley designation. And in, in addition, the specific plan amendments would allow the city council to consider additional street closures on Santa Cruz Avenue. Um, in addition to the central plaza concept that is currently in the downtown specific plan, as well as along other streets downtown, uh, provided that these street closures are consistent with the general plan circulation element. Uh, as mentioned uh, by Chair Doe in the, the um, overview of the agenda title, these amendments would be limited to minor circulation changes and modifications to public space. Uh, these would not increase the development potential of either the general plan or the El Camino Real downtown specific plan. And if I can get the next slide. Uh, so once again, this evening, the recommended actions uh, for the Planning Commission is to adopt two individual resolutions, Attachment A, which is to recommend the City Council approve amendments to the General Plan Circulation Element, and then Attachment B, which is to recommend the City Council approve amendments to the El Camino Real Downtown Specific Plan. And so with that, staff's available for clarifying questions. Thank you, Vaughn, for advancing the slide. Um, and uh, if, if there are no clarifying questions, would recommend that the Planning Commission open it up to public comment. Thank you, Mr. Parada. Any clarifying questions? Commissioner Eric. Thank you. Um, uh, in going through the proposed changes, I believe the last one, the, there was a proposed change to Section 5, an addition of a footnote about on street, on street space reduction. And I didn't quite follow how the addition of that footnote related to the general thing that we're doing here uh, with these amendments. So I was hoping you could quickly clarify. Yeah, sure, thank you, that's a great question. So uh, in going through this specific plan and looking at the proposed amendments uh, to the specific plan in, in this case, um, staff was looking for anywhere that uh, the street closure might create inconsistencies within the plan. So a lot of the minor edits to the downtown specific plan are really to create consistency between all chapters of the downtown specific plan. So there's a table in the plan that you're referencing that identifies the on-street parking spaces within the downtown area. And so the street closures for the time that the street is closed would remove that on-street parking. So the clarification is that though that number of spaces is subject to change. Um, you know, and, and was kind of a, an estimate. So, because there will be changes over time. That makes sense, thank you. Great, any other clarifying questions before we move to public comment? Yes, please. Oh, Commissioner Ricks. So, um, through the chair, um, if I could ask Mr. Parada, what, um, what 
What connectivity value are we putting on Santa Cruz Avenue as a, as a baseline question? For example, if you have stopped in uh, at um, Walgreens and are now ready to go across to uh, the new coffee shop by the train station, for the last three years you have been unable to do that directly you have to shunt over to either Oak Grove or Menlo, both of which are frequently backed up up to two blocks from El Camino. Um, during the pandemic, losing that connectivity seemed a reasonable trade, particularly in the presence of reduced traffic. But as someone who regularly had to commute from the north end of Menlo Park to Portola Valley, there really was no clear shot through downtown. There simply was not a, a transportation corridor. One had to go up into Atherton and take Valparaiso, uh, which we know works all right in the west direction, but in the easterly direction in the afternoon, you don't want that either. So how did we balance, and I'm not presupposing uh, what that balance should be, but I'm curious what element of that connectivity is included in this proposal? Um, and then following that, I'm gonna ask whether this, um, as it's phrased, street closure applies to both sides of the street, say in the uh, 600 block. Uh, sure, so let me, let me start with the first question. So I, th I think uh, it, when looking at Santa Cruz Avenue, it's important to look at the street classification in table one of the general plan. Um, and so we're not proposing to amend the uh, priorities um, that are identified in there in terms of uh, mobility, but just to reiterate the um, the highest priority for Main Street in the general plan is pedestrian uh, with medium priority for vehicles, transit, and bicycle. So pedestrian priority is the, the highest priority identified in Table 1 um, for the re Main Street Retail Street, which is what Santa Cruz Avenue uh, downtown is designated as. And then if you all right, but that response seems to imply that we've already assumed that Santa Cruz Avenue, at least in one or two blocks, is essentially a mall. And I don't see pedestrian use even close to that level. Uh, and I do see a desire for people to connect in uh, at least one direction, if not both. So, for example, where clearly on a street, pedestrian safety is more important than vehicular driver safety. It doesn't mean that we don't allow any vehicles on a given street. So again, in balance, um, where does the connectivity come in? And are we opening the door? Is this an invitation to close both in east and west directions of Santa Cruz? So I think in terms of the street closure, um, I think it's important to recognize a couple of things. So one, this evening, we're, we're not actually closing Santa Cruz Avenue. We're, we're not closing Main Street. We're not closing Ryan's, sorry. We're not closing Santa Cruz Avenue as Main Street in the uh, uh, proposed amendments, and we're not closing Ryan's Lane as the proposed local access alley. Uh, what these amendments would allow is for the city council to consider those, those questions that Commissioner Riggs, you're raising. Uh, regarding connectivity priorities, um, thinking through the city's general plan um, goals, policies, priorities, as well as the council's goals for um, and goals and priorities. Excuse me for the 2023 year. Um, specifically, I think as called out in the staff report, economic development being one of those. So those are policy decisions that the council would need to weigh when reviewing whether or not to adopt a resolution to actually close the street on a longer term or, or permanent or more permanent style basis. 
in, in terms of the connectivity, I, the, the current layout of the street closer closure is for the eastbound traffic. And I, while it ultimately is a decision for the city council, I, I think there is a uh, general um, desire to keep the westbound traffic for vehicles open. And as part of the street closure, maintain the existing closure along with some additional bicycle connectivity uh, through the street. But, but those are things that still need to be worked out. And once again, this evening, the, the recommendation is, or the evaluation is the change in the circulation element to provide that flexibility for the council to consider those options and weigh those pros and cons with regard to any future street closures, whether it is on the 600 block of Main Street slash Santa Cruz or any additional block in the downtown area when it's classified as Main Street. So I hope that clarifies a little bit of the, the focus this evening and the the policy decisions that Commissioner Riggs, you are, you know, uh, rightly so raising in terms of um, how the community should be looking at overall street closures in the downtown area. All right, and related to that, <clears throat> uh, the staff report seems to indicate that there is no circulation element downside to closing Santa Cruz Avenue. Um, how do we justify that? Or to put it another way, of the three neighbors who have brought this subject up to me in the last year or so, how do I respond to them that closing Santa Cruz won't really affect how they go from one place to another? It's all in their heads. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that all that question is appropriate for staff to respond to. I do think, though, that in terms of staff's evaluation of the the proposed additional language in table one of the circulation element uh, it is uh, staff believes and, and and has evaluated in the staff report and it's it's evaluation of the proposed amendments that uh, you know the potential for the council to consider street closures uh, on Santa Cruz Avenue here you know would be consistent with the uh, Main Street street classification, specifically, you know, regarding the priority of the pedestrian mode of travel, but also the fact that the goal of the general plan here in Table One is to, you know, create a high intensity pedestrian oriented retail street, um, which staff believes the flexibility uh, in the amendment as proposed to give the council that that flexibility you know, does is, or excuse me, is consistent with the circulation element. Um, once again, you know, I think Commissioner raised a lot of the, the questions you're raising are broader policy decisions. Um, you know, but I think staff's evaluation is that the proposal to allow for the flexibility is consistent with the general plan, is consistent with the specific plan with the amendments um, as drafted incorporated. All right, that's a fair answer, and and I apologize for my rather light use of uh, of reference to my neighbors. Um, my final question, and I, what I should do is bring them here and let them represent themselves, um, and then uh, can you relate what uh, interface you have had with the retailers on Santa Cruz? regarding this closure? Yeah, that's a good question. And admittedly, I don't have all the details. We do have, um, as part of the streetery program, uh, our economic development consultant has been liaising with businesses. So I don't have specifics, but our um, uh, HDL, our city um, city's economic development consultant has, has been discussing and reaching out to businesses. I'm, I'm happy to follow up separately, Commissioner Riggs, after the meeting. I just don't have those details right now. All right, but thank you for your responses. Thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Um, so if, if there are no other clarifying questions, um, I'm looking and I don't believe there are, let's, let's move to public comment, Ms. Um, Malathong, if you could um, 
inform us if we have any um, public commenters. Thank you, Vice Chair Do. Um, as a reminder, member of the public can press the hand icon on your screen upon which staff will introduce you and activate your microphone. Alternatively, for those calling into tonight's meeting, please start press star nine on your keyboard keypad to notify staff you have a comment. For any member of the public who are sharing a Zoom account or phone line with another commenter, please inform staff at the beginning of the public comment and staff will ensure that the other commenter speaks after you have finished your comment. At this point, I do not see a hand raise or a speaker card. Okay, well, let's go ahead and close public comment then. I think that was well, plenty. Actually, that's one person oh. just raised their hand. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, we have Randy Avolos. Um, sorry if I didn't pronounce your name properly. So you have three minutes. I'm gonna go ahead and um, allow you to speak. Hold on, let me. Oh, thank you, commissioners and staff. Good evening, everybody. Um, just to add some voice to those neighbors that were not calling in. Um, so two bits is yes, uh, this use of the commons does favor one type of business over another, and that should be kept in mind. It's more of a policy issue. Um, but also just have that context that, you know, for driving, um, some of you driving as a luxury, which is nice if you can do that. For others, it's a necessity and it's a burden. And if we're talking about producing density and below market rate housing for people who actually have to drive to work, um, something to keep in mind. That's all. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I do not see any other hand raise. Give it a few more moments. Any other um, public commenters? No, no okay. more. No, no public commenter. Okay, great. Well, let's close public comment and bring it back to the commission for um, a discussion and ultimately a vote on two resolutions to make a recommendation to city council, but would anyone like to start? Commissioner Schindler. Thank you, Vice Chair Doe. Um, through the chair, question to staff about um, the, the total number of, of restaurants or eating establishments that are participating in I guess what we're now calling the street areas program, but was originally the, the temporary outdoor use uh, permit. Um, are all of those businesses located on a main street, Santa Cruz Avenue, or an alley, the two street designations that we're talking about tonight and in this resolution? Yeah, thanks, uh, Commissioner Schindler, it's a good question. Uh, the short answer is no. Um, some of the topes were located on the side streets um, that connect to Santa Cruz. Um, you know, some, some have come and gone over over the years since the tope was uh, enacted in 2020. But uh, no, the tope program did include um, businesses that were not specifically on Santa Cruz or uh, within the, the alleys downtown. Okay. Thank you. Um, and through the chair, a follow-up question to that is, um, if, if we are intending to contemplate um, an extension or making permanent some of the street use, space use outside of Main Street or an alley, would this be the right time to include those other street types? in the modifications to the general plan, and I guess, and the specific plan? Or is there, is there, was there consideration of that? And if so, sort of, where did, where did we come out? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, I think the direction that the city staff received were to focus on the existing uh, closures that, that were, were done, you know, during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and, and not to expand it 
beyond um, Main Street slash Santa Cruz Avenue and uh, the alleys or I should say local access alley. There are alleys in the city that don't meet that criteria. So I want to be very cautious about um, using the right term versus a, a, a broader term for the alley. Um, Certainly the Planning Commission this evening could provide as part of his recommendation additional direction to staff. That's something we could look at. Uh, there there was, this, sorry, the city did prepare addendums to the program EIRs for both the downtown specific plan and the general plan. And so mm -hmm. any direction to potentially look at uh, additional uh, changes to the general plan amendment would need uh, staff to take a look at the environmental clearance for that as well. Um, you know, certainly expanding uh, potential uh, street closures or flexibility for the council to consider street closures on uh, more than just Main Street or the local access alleys. You know, could could have other environmental effects that we we would need to evaluate to determine you know whether or not an addendum is the appropriate mechanism. So there is a little bit of work that staff would need to do there than just. Uh, amending simply or, or excuse me changing the proposed amendments to the table one of the general plan so hopefully that provides a little bit of context but certainly something if the planning commission is interested in including or discussing um, it, it could be part of the motion and direction okay thank you that's that's very helpful context um, to just sort of further expand on where the question the origin of the question in my head um, i want to be sure that we're adhering to the principles that this this commission brings up on many occasions, which is being as equitable as possible across the various neighborhoods and, and locations across the city. Um, the the way that we're contemplating this, you know, is, is very much downtown focused on one side of town. Um, I know that there's at least I think that there is at least one other um, restaurant in the Willows that took play took part in um, some of the, the opportunities to extend outdoor space. Um, that wouldn't be met by this this definition, um, and I would probably just not 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 suggest that we change the course of action that's been proposed tonight um, and what's in the staff report. But I would I would like to be sure that we note um, that if this is successful and the city council considers making permanent or making extending or let's just go with extending um, some of the closures, that it gets equally considered for other locations across the city, which would require other street definitions to be added or modified, excuse me. Through the chair, if I could clarify one thing, I realized through Commissioner Schindler's statements there, um, there is a difference between the street closures and the streetery program that the city's working on. So the streetery program could apply more broadly. That That is looking at uh, the ability for businesses, restaurants, uh, excuse me, to uh, apply to the city for a permit for a streetery, as we're calling it. Um, it's an outdoor dining parklet, which could, which could be in the right of way and would utilize the parking spaces in front of that business. And so, so that would be different than a street closure that those could be located in areas beyond um, the potential extension of the existing current street closures on Santa Cruz and Ryan's Lane. So I, I want to clarify that, that there is that possibility and those could be potentially elsewhere than downtown. Those are things that we're still working through. And I don't have all the details this evening, but I understand the, the restaurant you're speaking of. Um, and I think that is something we're, we're taking into consideration. So there is a difference though between that streetery program and, and the street closure from the general plan, specific plan amendments this evening that the planning commission's taking a look at. Perfect. Thank, thank you for that reminder of, of the distinction between essentially, and I'm going to oversimplify, using the parking spaces versus closing the roads um, in terms of, of, of additional space. Um, I had one other. I think that was sort of my, my, my primary question. Um, I'll simply at this time just say that I am supportive of putting uh, into the hands of city council this discussion and evaluation um, and so if if the modifications to the general plan and the specific plan are the vehicle for doing that um, I am supportive of that um, and I will close off and hand it to others for comments I'll stop short of making a motion because I think we've got plenty of opportunity to chat here thank you Commissioner Schindler Commissioner Barnes Thank you for that. The discussion 
related to to Santa Cruz Santa Cruz Avenue um, certainly is in a, a recent discussion as it relates to how to increase the vibrancy of that particular corridor. Um, it certainly took the the pandemic and some of the impacts of that to cause some things to change along the way. Um, I am certainly supportive of providing council the flexibility to think through you know, what goes on on Santa Cruz Avenue. And it's the, you know, you've got hard goods, you've got F&B there, you've got different interests. And uh, looking at this, I think, comprehensively, I mean, if you think about it, if you put on, and this is the discussion that's been happening for years as, you know, the concept of live, work, play, the concept of when Station 1300 happens, when the Stanford project happens, how do you get some vitality? How do you increase the daytime foot traffic, nighttime foot traffic, and in, in getting vitality there? And you've got, I mean, you've got competing, excuse me, you've got competing um, areas. You've got Stanford Mall. You've got, well, we've got Stanford Mall. We've got Redwood City. We've got Palo Alto. Each one of these competes for the dollar of the average um, consumer, of the whether they're Menlo Park consumers, Atherton consumers, anyone in the general area. So how is it that Santa Cruz Avenue becomes or is something to somebody? Uh, and I think from a business development, economic development perspective, that's an important discussion to be having. So for that reason, without preordaining what will happen there, the impetus for doing something there has been a long time coming. And I think this is an extension of that. It was just brought on by some external forces. So um, I certainly, as we proceed through tonight's conversation, uh, support um, the recommendation uh, to look at these amendments. Um, the, the part of this, which which is a little bit of a bummer for, for my neighborhood, uh, the Willows, is um, it's so hard to get to Santa Cruz Avenue. If you, in my, my particular neighborhood is bounded by Willow Road on one side and Middlefield Road on the other side. And you've got a really treacherous area between Woodland, Middlefield Road, and Willow Road from a vehicular standpoint, from a pedestrian standpoint, from a bicycling standpoint. So the predominant um, destination for us in our neighborhood, I think if you pulled it consistently over the years, and it's you know the same as for today, is downtown Palo Alto. Not because of the, uh, the choices and things to do, mainly because it's easier to get to, mainly because if you want to be on a bike or if you want to be walking, uh, it's, it's uh, not only is it not safe, but no one really goes to Menlo Park from my neighborhood unless you're in a car. So for, and even in a car, it's easier to go to downtown Palo Alto. But um, when the circulation element came out and when the transportation master plan came out, one of the real important components to this was creating these connectivity uh, nodes, as they were called, connectivity network. And there was going to be some connectivity that was contemplated for from, from my neighborhood to get it more accessible to downtown Menlo Park. That hasn't happened yet. So there's a part of this discussion which is, yes, I think it's the right thing to revitalize Santa Cruz Avenue for, for, for my neck of the woods revitalize it, but it may not have an impact on us because we can't get there. So I would love to see as part of this discussion, making um, Santa Cruz Avenue accessible to those that are east of certainly El Camino or east of Middlefield Road to be able to get there and enjoy it. Because otherwise it's this, except for the Guild, which um, folks are getting to more and more, it becomes a uh, an abstract conversation about what's happening downtown uh, from a destination standpoint, because we simply aren't, aren't going there with the regularity I know that my neighbors would like. So yes, I support this, but it's a bummer because we don't really have access to it. Um, so I'll leave my comments for there. Thank you. 
Thank you, Commissioner Barnes. Commissioner Riggs. Um, I uh, very much appreciate the input uh, from staff um, a few minutes ago. Um, and I, I think I would like to respond that we are being asked to modify an existing ordinance in order to open the door for city council to close a couple of streets. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of anybody uh, holding uh, particular value to being able to go down Ryan's court. Uh, I know I haven't missed it. Um, but I don't think the same thing applies to Santa Cruz Avenue. Uh, I go occasionally down to Santana Row and they have closed off one of the blocks there. And yet, amazingly, the adjacent block still has motor vehicle traffic. And that's an environment where adjacent to the closed block, you have a three level parking garage. Actually, there are two of them. Um, we don't have a parking garage. We zoned for it. Um, back in 2012 and we haven't done a thing about it uh, and while i'm not one of them i understand there are people who decide well let's not go downtown to menlo park at lunchtime there isn't any parking i don't particularly agree with that but there doesn't appear to be enough parking and it's quite evident from the small amount of uh, permit requests to upgrade Santa Cruz that as a retail space that does not have a parking option, it has a parking option in code, but because there's no parking structure, there's no parking option in reality, there's no financial justification to take a 5,000 square foot building, knock it down, and build a another 5,000 square foot building up in the air so that you can park underneath it. It just doesn't pencil out and it never will. Part of this stalemate is to do with the makeup of council, not just this year, but two years ago, five years ago, six years ago. And the makeup of council does change. And there will be times when we think four out of five council members are the best thing that's ever happened for this city. Let's open the door for council to make any decisions they want. And four years later, we may be saying, who the heck said that council could make any decision they want about what goes down on Santa Cruz? There used to be an ordinance. Sort of reminds me of our um, federal monetary regulations that are always uh, pulled back significantly just a couple of years before a recession. So just for me, this isn't the right time or the right move to open the door for the modifications that are described here in this staff report. I think if the staff report referred only to eastbound Santa Cruz and only on the one block, because I would like to support and maintain the two restaurants, one in particular, that have invested so much in our downtown and in that part of the street. If that were the case, um, I think I would be much more supportive. So just to share, if it's not obvious, um, I can support part of this um, calendar item, um, but at this time, uh, I think to make both changes uh, would be inappropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Other commenters? Sure. Okay. Oh. 
Thank, thank you. I, I have a follow up question through the church of staff um, that builds on on some of the points that Commissioner Riggs um, thoughtful points triggered for me. Um, I think of the two major things that are proposed in the definition of the various classifications of streets in the general plan. The addition of an alleyway is a no brainer. It's not in there today. So if it's if we don't add it, it cannot be regulated. But there is a definition of Main Street. If the definition of Main Street wasn't changed to explicitly call out that it can be fully or partially closed, could it still be fully or partially closed by through some other mechanism? Um, it's a good question. So uh, it would be inconsistent to close Main Street, i.e. Santa Cruz Avenue, to vehicle traffic given the current circulation element. So a, a longer term closure beyond the temporary closure that was put in place during COVID-19 would not be consistent with the general plan. Um, at the direction of the council in the discussion in February regarding the streetery program, uh, staff have researched and evaluated and determined that to provide that ability to continue with the existing street closure, it, the general plan would need to be amended. And so those are the amendments before the planning commission this evening. So short answer, no, longer answer is a little bit of that backstory that I just gave. Th thank you, thank you for helping me scratch that itch, thanks. Commissioner Farrick. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate the thoughtful comments and questions people have asked. It's definitely food for thought. Um, in general, I'm I I think, you know, before hearing anybody else, my inclination was to support this because it, you know, in times when city council needs to have some flexibility to do some obvious things they need to have it and like then it doesn't create the problem that many cities including ours had by having to kind of rush and set up something in 2020 um, and it had already been on the radar for years as um, uh, staff member Prada shared in 2015 and beyond so I guess you know so I I'm I feel less um, concerned that there would be some sort of an abuse of this power <laughs> that council would have but i do agree that you know with commissioner riggs that it's important to really in, um, understand the ramifications to see if there is a safeguard that could be put in that makes sense um, you know i don't want to exclude other parts of the city too when commissioner barnes was describing getting to downtown I was like well I'm already halfway there when I get to you so <laughs> so um uh and I you I I like that we have a nice downtown and it's nice to go to I was there this morning and it was lovely um so I guess you know that's a, a rambling way of saying I really appreciate all the all the all the comments and I guess the question then is you know I, I'm supportive of this um, of this proposed amendment recommendation to council. And the question is then, is there anything in maybe it's a question for our council that it would be a concern around the safeguards or or power that a council would have to do something that's not in the best interests of the community with this? So um, maybe I can start and then um, uh, look to our city attorney uh, for some additional uh, input if needed. I think one thing to clarify though is that these amendments do not close the streets but require the plan, the, sorry, the city council to consider those street closures and adopt additional resolutions. So those, those street closures, um, to the extent but um, wherever when how they occur uh, would be reviewed by the city council there would be the need for the public review um, for the council to adopt um, you know at a public meeting 
the street closure by resolution. Um, so there, it, it certainly at this point, uh, the council would still need to review each individual street closure. And at that time, there can be a discussion about, uh, you know, parameters put on that closure time period design of the closure, whether it's two way or one way traffic, bike pet improvements, uh, you know, so that there are a number of things the council and the community could consider through that discussion, through that process to determine whether to close any individual segment of uh, Santa Cruz Avenue, i.e. Main Street or the public alleys downtown, the uh, local access alleys, call them that. So hopefully that helps provide a little bit of context. Yeah, it, for sure. And um, it sounds so, so the short way of saying it is whatever the proposal is, there would be a public process that businesses, community members could weigh in on. It's not that they suddenly have um, the ability to just to do whatever changes. I think um, I know <laughs> when you were talking, Commissioner Riggs, it reminded me of the um, possibly considered ill-fated pilot for street furniture and that might be what you, is on your mind but uh, no <laughs> but i guess you know i think that had public process and i think you know that's part of the work of a city is to let's try things let's see how this works and then you know change course if it's not benefiting enough uh, members of the community so yeah i guess i'll leave it there and just say that this change makes sense to me and i do think that these decisions, given that there is the safeguard of a public hearing, you know, belong in the council's hands. Thank you, Commissioner Fair. Commissioner Briggs. Thank you. Um, I am um, several times a week have been going up to uh, San Mateo to the north central neighborhood. It's um, sort of roughly their their bell haven um and one of the improvements that were made there with public hearings was to take away the parking in front of the homes on north humboldt so that there could uh, be added a bike lane on each side um, in eight months i have actually yet to see a single bicycle on the bike lanes morning evening or lunchtime, but I'm told that several blocks away they do exist. In the meantime, part of the same public process, they added bulb outs, which decreases the distance that you have to walk to cross the street. Now, there's not a lot to cross on Humboldt because it's county or school property on the other side, but you know maybe it's busy at 3 p.m. The thing is that the bulb outs used the same space as the bike lane. So they striped the bike lane to divert out into the middle of the road at each intersection and then come back again. It is the nuttiest conclusion that you could ever see, but I'm sure it had all the traffic analysis and design and, and $100,000 consultant fees that are appropriate for a public process. So. I'm simply not as confident about public process, um, whether it's 20 years ago or 18 months ago. So I would like to suggest, I realize that there's impetus and desire here, and I see, although we don't have a Menlo Park Chamber of Commerce, we have a County Chamber of Commerce, and the representative is here, and has no objections, apparently, to to this revision. So in what I would call modified support, I would like to make a motion. I would like to make a motion to adopt the resolution uh, that is attachment A for the circulation element and adopt the resolution that would be attachment B uh, for the specific plan that would allow alley closures and would allow the closure of one side of El Camino as is currently used and the need and uh, desire and financial backing are demonstrated on, uh, on Santa Cruz on the eastbound side. And I think that's the 600 block. Um, 
And I think that would allow our temporary situation to be, if city council so desires, made into a permanent situation. And if the time comes when there's interest in simply closing an entire block of Santa Cruz and trying out a pedestrian mall, that there be an appropriate process at that time and I guess I'll be so bold as to suggest that the seven of us at least get a chance to hold one of our public hearings. Um, so that's my motion. And through the chair, if I could look to staff, uh, is, is that motion with that modification um, a legally acceptable action for us? So let, let me just read back what I what I have first, and, and then we can answer the second part. So it's uh, to approve or recommend approval to the city council um, the proposed circulation element amendments in attachment A um, with the modification that uh, the main street designation would only allow for one way street closures in the main street. Um, and, and is it also only the 600 block? I was yes, unsure I think if that we have was a only. demonstrated need there. And since 2012, we just have not had the investment in Santa Cruz Avenue. And again, um, you know, just having had three different clients on that street, I know what the issue is each time. We can't knock down one building and build another one if we don't have parking. And that, and that's at least a half dozen years away. So I, I think this is realistic for this time and this reality. So, so just to confirm, it's... The 600 it, it, block. I'm sorry? 600 yes. block, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, it, so the recommendation is one-way street closure and only within the 600 block of San Cruz Avenue. Yeah, and I don't know if you actually have a separate nomenclature. That might be the 650 block, right? I, I think we understand that we, could, we staff yeah. could, uh, instead of using addresses bounded by the, the two side streets, we, we, we can work on that separately outside the motion. I think we understand the, the request. I, I think uh, unless the city attorney disagrees, I think the planning commission can consider that amendment and deliberate on whether or not to incorporate that into its uh, recommendation or adoption of attachment A with the modification. just want to confirm attachment B would possibly also need to be modified uh, if the planning commission is interested in uh, adding this modification. I think we would want potentially direction from the planning commission to allow staff to um, modify the proposed amendments to the downtown specific plan for consistency with this revised um, um, uh, modification to attachment A. If it's, we, we can certainly have that discussion, but I think we would need time to work that out between planning commission and city council meetings. So if planning commission directs staff to make it consistent, we can do that if this motion is ultimately um, adopted by the planning commission. Of course, I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, thank you, Commissioner Riggs, for your modified support. I think you called it and proposed first. Um, I, I was just going to make a comment that um, these amendments wouldn't actually, Mr. Prouty pointed out, wouldn't actually go towards creating more street closures, but just give city council that policy flexibility. Um, and so as described in the staff report, I found I, I could support that. Um, I'm not sure I'm ready to, I, and, I, and I appreciate the, the caution and um, the experience you br bring observing, you know, uh, um, other situations throughout the peninsula, Commissioner Riggs. Um, well, I'll, I'll just stop. I saw Commissioner Ferry, your, your hand go up. 
<laughs> Thank you. I think I'm, I was, I was, I'm going to try to express a similar thing in that I thought one of the nice ways through these amendments is that flexibility they would get. I wouldn't want to pin a general plan amendment on the current location of a couple of restaurants. They will come and go over the decades. And I think there needs to be flexibility planning for where these sorts of things should happen, but not specifically geared toward a current business that's there because the um, that can change, that will change um, for better and for worse. Um, Through the chair, mm -hmm. would you have a alternative then um, that uh, might avoid a full street closure, um, but not necessarily stick it to the 600 block? I, I didn't consider that, you know, so I don't have a, like a, uh, an alternative. I guess my concern with limiting it to a very specific location doesn't give the flexibility in case some phenomenal, another restaurant down the next block or the black next block, uh, you know, why wouldn't there be that flexibility, um, when, yeah, it, you know, with a general plan amendment, I think it's an important thing to kind of look to the long term. So, yeah, I don't have an amendment I, uh, to your amendment. I just have concerns about the amendment and I didn't want to create too, too narrowly specific of a change that then this doesn't really achieve much um, as, the, as the community and businesses change over. Thank you, Commissioner Farrick. I think you um, express what I was hinting at. Um, and Commissioner Riggs, I hear you about the bikes and the bull bouts, but I still have conf I. Oh, you should see it. <laughs> well, I just. <laughs> With the green stripes <laughs> that march over to the middle of the road and then they march back again. Well, I, well, I won't. <laughs> Commissioner Riggs. Um, so uh, I agree with the input of both uh, the chair and Commissioner Schindler. So I would like, I mean, Farrakh. <laughs> so I would like to, um, uh, with the help of staff, reword that where the intent is to maintain some level of traffic flow um, and yet respond to the investments of um, restaurateurs. Um, I'm not at all confident that we will be so supportive of a future restaurant that we will let them take half of the street. Uh, in addition to the sidewalk and the parking, um, but um, I certainly do appreciate flexibility uh, when you're talking about a zoning ordinance. And if there's a way that you can suggest perhaps that would not tie it to a specific block, but rather um, express the preference to keep traffic moving on at least one side of the block. I think that would allow things to progress in the future. You know, with luck, they progress. Through the chair, I, I, is that a question for staff to provide some guidance? Through the chair, I, whoop, I may have one idea on that. Please. It, like if there was just a, an additional bullet point that sort of states that expression of preference to basically not ignore the needs of traffic circulation and to try to keep one lane open, is that would that suffice to kind of but then leave the rest kind of more as it is? Is that what you're okay? Yeah, I mean, um, among us. I'm a little concerned that we're already restricting traffic, but, you know, again, the retail community hasn't stepped forward, uh, at least at this hearing. I mean, you read about it in the paper from other communities, but, yeah, just in, in an effort to be supportive to this flexibility. 
Commissioner Barnes. Thank you for that. I guess I'm struggling a little bit with a first or a second. Um, and I guess kind of the direction we're going in. I, uh, I feel comfortable providing whether it's the economic. So I don't know that restricting uh, vehicular traffic is a good idea. I don't know that restricting vehicular traffic is a bad idea. And, and, and frankly, it's not my purview the way in on that. Um, I see this particular exercise as an exercise in allowing the a development of a best practice for what the community wants for this particular area to come and be surfaced. And, um, and I think tipping the scales in terms of what might or might not be a good idea is in fact tipping the scales prior to determinations of what is or is not a good idea. Um, uh, so for that reason, um, if, if your motion, if the motion that I believe is on the table subject to an amendment dies, I'm happy to make a motion to recommend the proposed amendments for the um, general plan circulation element and downtown specific plan uh, as per the staff report. But let me let yours either live or die and then I'll come in behind it and just say that the my thinking behind it is to let this let the concepts come up and then be debated and fleshed through in a way that is representative of the community as opposed to particular preferences that we may or may not have on this particular dais. So um, having said that, I'll wait to see what the next move is. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Barnes. Um, I do want to return to a point, Mr. Prada, you made to that. Um, if we're looking at adherence to the general plan, the definition of the main street prioritizes um, pedestrian um, mobility. So, you know, whether or not, I think what Commissioner Barnes is saying that we don't, may not have the purview to say, indicate our preference, but to evaluate it according to that definition that's in the general plan. Um, but with that, there's a first on the table, I believe, from Commissioner Riggs um, to, and, 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 and then I understand that we're doing this together, is that correct? To adopt a resolution to amend the, the general plan and specific plan. Um, and I and I forgive me. Your amendment is to not not pin it to a specific geographic location, but uh, but to to maintain uh, maintain at least a one directional uh, traffic flow. Maintain a direct one direction of traffic flow. As opposed to full closure of a block. Um, which is, that's a whole discussion. So yeah, that is the preference. Thank you. So that's the first um, that we have on the table from Commissioner Riggs. Discussion, Ra. I just have a, a clarifying question. There was a version of the motion that I think read something like uh, changing the amendment such that instead of the amendment saying that a full street could be closed, only one side of the street could be closed. This version of the amendment seems to be not that, but rather expressing a preference, but allowing the language as it exists in the amendment to remain the same and that, adding adding a preference statement. And I'm yes. curious which version of the motion we're discussing. That was an astute observation. It was also an astute insertion by uh, Mr. Parada, which uh, I have to appreciate, it does widen the flexibility of city council, but allows us to express a concern. Yes. So thank you for bringing that up. Does that mean that we're on the, the, the latter version is the one that we're, that you, okay. Can I ask a question through the chair, Can question for staff? Um, 
Oh my gosh, I had it in my head a second ago. Uh, apologies. So if, so I'm looking, I'm just kind of trying to scan the, the Connect Menlo El Camino specific plan for the circulation, the whole, you know, the circulation element is 50 pages. I guess where I'm going with this is, is this already addressed in the sense of as a council were to consider a thing before it, a proposed half street closure or whatever it is, a, a part of a streetery program or a streetery application, would they would already be required or it would already be baked in to have circulation addressed writ large, including auto traffic, uh, pedestrian, bikes, et cetera, all the, all the various modes just for circulation. So I guess where I'm going is I'm trying to determine if the amendment to the amendment is necessary or if it's already part of the process. Yeah, so it, it's a good question. I think it, it uh, is an opportunity for staff to clarify. So the, the streetery program is not dependent upon the street closures. It, it is one facet that provides some flexibility for the council to consider street closures that um, potentially allow for expansion of the streetery uses beyond the parking spaces or for other changes. So uh, I, I know we've been focused this evening on the, the restaurants on the 600 block. There is also a publicly available seating area um, that, that is not tied to a restaurant that, that any member of the community you know, can use um, you know, uh, throughout the day. Um, it is also the location of the Bon Marsh uh, market on Wednesday evenings, so the outdoor market. So while that's not super germane to your question, I'm just trying to kind of provide some context in terms of the streetery program uh, is independent, but there is some overlap, if that makes sense. It's kind of an awkward way to say it, but, but the streeteries would be evaluated case-by-case um, -case basis against the streetery design guidelines and standards. Um, and against the allowed um, areas that the streeters would be allowed to take up in terms of the number of parking spaces, where those are located on the street. But that would that takes into account bicycle, vehicle, pedestrian access around those. It, it, it also does remove parking spaces or would remove parking spaces for those streeteries specifically. That, that is an independent project, um, but also does have some, some basis in, in the street closure general plan amendments to allow for some of the existing um, expanded streeteries to be maintained, as well as some of the existing um, uses of the street closure. And, and to the commission's discussion this evening, it, it is written in a way that allows for that flexibility for the council to consider other uh, full, partial, um, you, know, you know, on a temporary or long-term or permanent basis, uh, street closures. Right, so I guess the question though is, as they consider whatever the proposal is, circulation would be part of what they consider. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I think I missed that part of your question, and I provided a longer I, I answer. I added a whole bunch of fluff <laughs> around it. So, that. Uh, so that might get to a point that staff made previously, where as part of any street closure, the city council would be evaluating that closure as it relates to um, circulation at large being vehicles, pedestrian, bicyclists, as well as any other uses within that uh, closed street um, that, that may either conflict or enhance the, the circulation. So that would be considered as part of any street closure, as part of that um, public review by the council, as part of the consideration of their adoption of a potential resolution to close any portion of um, Main Street or local access alleys if those are ultimately adopted by the council as amendments to the general plan. This is a step in the process this evening to provide a recommendation for the council's consideration. Okay, so that was, um, yes, in other words, they would consider circulation with a proposal as it's written in the staff report. Correct. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Great. So it sounds like um, we have a first on the table from Commissioner Riggs. I, I don't think I heard. Uh, we don't have a second. Don't have a second. Um, you, you realize in Mountain View, they have a similar process and they're closing Castro Street. Commissioner Schindler. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Doe. Um, I am 
unable to provide a second and would not at this point can just signal that I'm, I wouldn't be comfortable supporting the modified version. Um, I do, for, for two reasons, two big reasons, two main reasons. Um, one is that for all of the excellent reasons that have been given here tonight, whether they're circulation or economic or thinking about future development of retail, future development of parking, um, I think the entity that has the most insight into all of those things and the authority to weigh them, again, with each other, as well as input from the community, um, from staff, from entities out, even outside of Menlo Park, I, I think the city council and, and the supporting mechanisms around them are the right place. That's sort of the nucleus of all of that. So it is a super complicated and sophisticated question, and I can't think of a better vehicle for having those issues surfaced, discussed, and ultimately decided. Um, and maybe I suffer from a lack of imagination, but I can't think of one. Um, the second reason that I support it is because I don't want to, it's melodramatic, but death by a thousand paper cuts of change. Right, if we sort of introduce incremental little changes and we have to go back through a four step process that involves the general plan and the specific plan every time we want to make a modification to one street definition and we go a half street at a time or one street type at a time, um, it, it just slows things down. And I think we've, we have enough issue with bureaucracy, particularly as it relates to evolving and innovating and enlivening the downtown an El Camino corridor, um, that I'm, I'm reluctant to do that. With that, I will say that my personal preference is to not have all of Santa Cruz closed. Um, I'm also very wary of the word permanent in all of this language. I don't believe permanent a permanent closure would be a good idea under any circumstances. I think we should always contemplate decisions like that on a three, five, ten year time horizon. Um, but I'm going to leave it in there again, a faith in the process. Um, so there's, that's for me. Thank you, um, Commissioner Schindler. Um, again, I, I, I think I feel the same way. Um, so I'm not quite sure how to. Commissioner Barnes, apologize. Uh, no, I was just turning it back on. Ms. Commissioner Riggs was. Um, giving me a collegial courtesy and pointing to me because I'm happy to make a motion um, with the express intent of not to cut off any additional uh, discussion. And if it sounds like we're ready, we should just let a motion live or die as it, as it lives, or, lives or dies and we can move on and you know iterate from there. Um, so I'm happy to make a motion, but right before I do that, I do, I do want to just stick my hand in the pile for iteration and innovation, and I think trying different stuff is important, and I think the city staff trying different things, and some stuff works, some stuff doesn't. Some closures may work, some closures may not. Things can be changed, but um, I really want to add my voice to whatever it is that folks are thinking up or cooking up to get some vitality in downtown Mendel Park. Let's do it. Let's think about it. Let's have at it. Um, and it's okay to make a mistake because we can unwind it. It's not, that's just not going to be no cost to it, but better to have looked at other things, tried something and made a mistake than not tried anything at all. So for that reason, uh, I am comfortable. And in this particular area, um, with this particular subject matter saying, we've got good staff, we've got smart counsel, let's try some things. So with that in mind, I am going to make a motion that we, and I'm going to pull this up to make sure I get it. Sorry. I'm going to recommend uh, that we recommend the city council uh, the adoption of the proposed amendments to the city of Menlo Park general plan circulation element and the El Camino Real downtown specific plan. So that is. Uh, I'm recommending the proposed amendments and um, we can check with staff to see if that's, uh, it's a recommendation, so I don't know that it is, has to be that quite defined, but um, that's my, that, I'll just put that on the table.
table as a first. Yes, and I'm sorry, I blanked out there for a moment. Your, the, um, your motion is to adopt the resolution um, as... I don't know that's a resolution because it's a recommendation. Sorry, resolution recommending... Yes, the city not to Council. be too particular. Yes. No, of course, thank you. Adopt a resolution recommending the city council amend the circulation element of the general plan and El Camino... <laughs> Yes, there's two pieces here. There is the general plan circulation element and there's a DSP downtown specific plan and we are being asked this evening to contemplate the uh, proposed amendments to both of those. Yes. And to both of those, I will make a motion that we recommend to city council the proposed amendments as put, board, put forth by staff. That's my first. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Barnes. Commissioner Schindler. I, I will second the resolutions that say date that we would recommend to city council the modifications to the circulation plan of the general circulation element of the general plan and the downtown specific plan. First from Commissioner Barnes and a second from Commissioner Schindler to um, adopt a resolution recommending that the city council amend the circulation element of the general plan and amend the El Camino Real downtown specific plan as recommended by staff. Um, if there's no further discussion, then let's um, go for a vote. Commissioner Barnes. Yes. Commissioner Eric. I will vote yes. And I also just want to say I appreciate both what Commissioner Schindler and Commissioner Barnes said. I thought that it was well put and I agree with them. Thank you. Commissioner Farrick. Yes. Commissioner Riggs. Uh, no. Commissioner Schindler. Yes. I will also vote yes. So that's five yeses and one no. And the resolution making that recommendation to city council passes. Through the chair, may I make a comment? Certainly. Anya, I know the item is over. I just wanted to just comment that the robust discussion was really helpful for me to understand this uh, more fully. So I appreciate all the perspectives and uh, historic and future for future proof and otherwise. And and I, I agree with that. <laughs> Agreed. You are both, you're all three diplomats. Thank you. <laughs> so with that, I believe that we can close item F2. And that brings us to G, informational items. Mr. Parada. Uh, thank you. Yes, we do have a number of updates from staff. I uh, just want to provide a little bit of a heads up for the Planning Commission on some items that we're tracking for the two meetings in August. So the commission scheduled to meet on August 14th and the 28th. Um, we are tracking potentially the um, uh, initial actions, which, which would include some final actions and some recommended actions uh, from the Planning Commission to the City Council on the 123 Independence Drive project. Um, exact dates are still in flux for all these, so I'm, I'm not saying for sure on the 14th or the 28th at this point, but these are things we're tracking. We're also tracking uh, potentially the uh, final actions and certification of the EIR for the 1125 O'Brien Drive project at one of the August meetings. Um, and also some potential ordinance modifications or amendments, excuse me, uh, to the zoning ordinance to facilitate electrification of existing buildings. Um, once again, that, that's probably uh, either the 14th or the 28th. I can't commit at this point, um, but we'll know more at the end of this week when we publish or send our mailed notices out. And then lastly, we are tracking a study session for the housing element zoning ordinance updates. That is likely to be on the 14th. Um, I, I feel pretty confident providing that uh, date. It is still tentative, but uh, looking at um, our workflow for, for the housing element update and the implementation with the zoning ordinance amendments, uh, it's likely to go to the Planning Commission as a study session on the 14th. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, that completes my announcements for the items we're tracking. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, once again, those are tentative. Uh, a lot of large projects that staff is, is working um, to advance through the Planning Commission review this uh, summer. Any questions? Commissioner Barnes. So I'll make sure this is not for discussion, but I'll just float it into the ether. I'm wondering if there's any 
support amongst uh, our colleagues here to begin planning commission at 6 p.m. as opposed to 7 p.m. Council starts at 6. It had been floated to this body, um, and, and I, for one, was like, nope, got to do it at 7. And for selfish reasons, A, I was coming back from the office, so it was tough to get here at time. Uh, and B, I had a kid that was 6 or 5 or 7 or 8, whatever. I think from my personal perspective that starting at 6 would serve us to get out earlier and improve the quality of life and, and, and you know, make it easier to serve on this body. That's my personal opinion. We don't need to have discussion on it, but if it's something that this body wanted to take up, I certainly think it's worth considering. In other words, starting at 6 versus at 7 in the evening. Those are my thoughts. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, one additional uh, information item. Just want to uh, make sure that uh, the commission is aware that uh, staff is available. If there are any questions along for G1, the summary of the environmental justice and safety elements. Um, I jumped to staff updates um, without asking if the commission had any questions on that item. Questions for Mr. Parada? Commissioner, uh, sorry. I'm, nope. Commissioner was Ferry. There, was there an it's item actually for not, this? It, Oh, it's not on yeah. that this item. So it, if you want to go first, Commissioner Schindler, that's fine. But it made me reminded me of a different topic I want to ask about. Um, thank you. I, I did have a follow up question and it may have been something that I missed in the nuance of listening to the meeting because I was not here for this particular discussion. Um, I know that we the next step is to have an additional public hearing after some revisions have been made to the, the policies and programs. Um, what wasn't clear to me is when the roughly 125 programs that were listed in the environmental justice um, report go through that framework, right? So there were a number of different evaluations that were presented as columns in a sheet. Um, once they have been prioritized, scored, and assessed, and brought back to, I guess, to us in the fall, um, will there still be, I'm going to try and simplify this, will there still be 125 possible programs, or will, through the prioritization process, some things actually essentially be, be struck from the list? So I'm going to Thank, thank you for the question. I'm going to turn that over to Calvin Chan, our senior planner, who's uh, been leading the environmental justice and safety element component to the housing element <coughs> update. So thank Calvin's you. available for questions. Thank you, Commissioner Schindler, through the chair. Um, staff is working through that refinement process right now, and we, uh, perfectly honestly, we have we have that same uh, question as we are working with our consultants and also continuing to do our community outreach. We're looking at ways to streamline and reduce the quantity of the policies and programs while still maintaining the overall feedback that the community provided. Um, we do certainly want to provide an action framework that is prioritized and also manageable in terms of implementation and certainly as you pointed out having over a hundred policies and programs um, one may feel that that could be a bit too um, too much to accomplish in that in that time frame so we are we are still working on that we are in close contact with m group our lead project consultant as well as communicating with change lab solutions who is a leader in this field and also working closely with climate resilient communities our community outreach partner to continue and refine that framework. So we look forward to uh, presenting to the Planning Commission as well as the City Council our refined uh, work at an upcoming study session in the fall. Thank you, that's very helpful. And if I may very briefly, I swear to be brief, express a preference for having some way of conveying to the public um, the, 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 the sort of an assessment of, um, well, let's see. The framing is that in a perfect world with unlimited resources, we do everything on that list, but we don't have unlimited resources in staff, um, other resources and funding. And I think it's very helpful to be able to present a, a categorization of projects that we think we are very, very confident we have the resources to do. Those are the things at the top of our list. 
a, ba a set of programs that we might be able to do given if we, there were incremental resources or depending on how things play out. And then a bottom tier that essentially says, we do think these things are important, but we are lacking the resources to do them. And I think it's, it's good practice for us to give that public visibility into what could be accomplished um, with, with more resources. Um, not necessarily for the pro exact purpose of the environmental justice report, but as framing for future discussions about, for example, revenue generation strategies, as framing for discussions about staffing um, or other consulting relationships. Um, so if, if, I, if I were given a preference, I would love to see all the programs still on a list, but with a very distinct tiering in them related to the resources that we have. Thank you. Shall, shall I ask my question? Thank so th through the chair, if I may, just real quick, uh, I, we need to be mindful of the fact that this is an informational item. Uh, so appreciate Commissioner Schindler's input. I do want to be cognizant of not moving too far beyond a intended one-way communication with the opportunity to answer clarifying questions on the communication. Uh, so prior to any other questions, just want to make sure that, that we, we are mindful that we really shouldn't have too many uh, discussions or, or a dialogue on on the merits at all here or, or any of the content, but rather just any clarifying clarifying questions, um, willing willing to continue that a little bit longer, but, but we do need to be careful about, about going too far here. So um, hopefully that helps with a little bit of context to, to, to just ask clarifying questions specifically and, and, and not anything further. Thank you, Mr. Prada, for keeping us on track. Commissioner Farrick. Thank you, uh, Chair Doe, or Acting Chair Doe, however you'd like to go today. Um, as it relates to the housing element, I'm curious if we can get a status update because of the recent newspaper article about an, uh, a proposed project that I know is way too early for us to actually consider the project itself in any near, near future. However, the builder's remedy it was being mentioned as, and so I guess, like a status update on what, what of the housing element update being approved, and and a primer on, you know, I'd like to request a primer on the builder's remedy as it relates to mixed use projects at some near time planning commission meeting, because I'm already getting questions from the community members uh, that saw that newspaper article. <laughs> So would love some info on things related so that I'd at least have some better foundational facts to know. Yeah, I think I'll just respond to the housing element component briefly, uh, and then I think anything else we can follow up separately um, as appropriate and as agendized. Uh, we're currently in the uh, HCD review phase of, of our revised housing element, so um, it's a 60-day review period. Um, that we're currently in, waiting comments back or, or completion of their review. I'm happy answering that part. I think beyond that, I think it'd be getting too far down uh, away from this topic. Okay. And if there is, could there, I would like to request that maybe it's agendized to, like, uh, or sent as an informational item in a packet to just um, have a better understanding of the builder's remedy as it relates to mixed use projects. Yeah, we can look into that separately. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Barnes. Thank you for that. And I have a question for Mr. Chan, and it does relate to G1. Uh, Mr. Chan, was there any discussion related to the environmental um, justice element that linked community amenity resources to the programs or potential programs to be considered through the environmental justice report program. Thank you for the uh, question, Commissioner Barnes through the chair. At the joint study session of June 20th, there was some discussion between some planning commission members as well as city council about potential 
funding sources, community amenities was raised as something for staff to look into. And as part of our next uh, study session that we'll be bringing back to the Planning Commission, we will be looking at uh, ways to identify different funding sources, whether they be uh, grants, different things to look at at the uh, local, federal, or state level um, to help really action uh, these items. And community amenities is one of the things that we will be looking into. And I believe this uh, is an okay question, given the agendized content. Um, given that the community amenity list is scheduled to be read and approved at the next city council meeting, will the timing work out so that what is contemplated, so there will be provisions within there'll be allowances made for potentially as community uh, environmental justice um, funding from the community amenities list if in fact it gets approved. In my recollection was these programs were not included when we first saw the community amenities list. So it's a sequencing question. And are you able, are you able to answer that? So I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, and I do want to be mindful of Thank you. Deviating too far here, this really, this is going beyond the scope of an informational item. But to clarify, as a comment that uh, staff mentioned previously at this, this meeting and the updates in the beginning, the community amenities list was adopted by a resolution by the city council on July 11th. So that list is active. The second reading of the community amenities ordinance amendments, which were really intended to clarify the appraisal instructions or the requirements for the creation of some modifications to the appraisal instructions, the timing for that appraisal in terms of the date of value that we discussed last uh, July 11th, or sorry, the June meeting, excuse me, uh, and um, also the identification that the council would adopt community many regulations, but those are separate from the list. The list is adopted and active. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, there's no more questions on G informational items. Well, Commissioner Eric. <laughs> Sorry. Um, back to G G2. Or am I allowed to do that? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I guess this is a question for staff. Commissioner Barnes brought up a uh, point earlier around the timing of this meeting. Am I allowed to make a comment on that or do I need to? I, I, I think that's going to start a dialogue. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Commissioner Eric. Um, I, I think we can pull the commission separately on that. And, and if we need to have a discussion, we can agendize that. I, I think that that's that's going to start a, a an issue here. Yeah. I have no further comments. Then. Okay. Well, thank, thank you for um, following up then on that individually with the, the commission. That's appreciated. Um, so with that, we'll close G informational items and adjourn this meeting.